Jesus said, I am resurrection and I am life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For I am sure that neither death nor life no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. We brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. With faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the body of our brother, Michael Dennis, for burial. Our brother was washed in holy baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore with confidence pray to God our Heavenly Father, the giver of life, that he will raise him to perfection in the company of the saints. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Michael Dennis. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth, until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Rest eternal, grant unto him, O Lord. And may his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed for the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Kindly sit for the eulogy, which will be read by Nicole Clark Bridge. Michael Dennis Clark was born the 16th of December, 1949, the third child of Hazel and Joseph, commonly known as Tommy Clark. Hazel died while Daddy was still quite young, and Tommy migrated to England during his early years, events that would eventually shape the individual he would become. Initially, Dennis, as he was known, grew up in Tumwell Hill, but as he would proudly say, 
when conditions were not to his liking, he and his brother Gregory, who we call George, walked th from there to Constant Lance and George to be raised by his aunt Vaudry and grandfather Archibald Arta King. At age nine, Dennis was awarded a scholarship to the University of Waterford, which he was very proud of, of which he was a very proud graduate. In school, he earned the nicknames Pigeon and Bramble Scratch, but he never revealed their origin. One of his proudest moments was when his granddaughter also passed for common mayor, up and on daddy. Later, he met and married June Brathwick, and that marriage produced three girls, Nicole, Donna, and Kimberly. He also had a daughter, Duana, and it was with great pride that he named each of them and his granddaughter, Gabrielle. Daddy was articulate, intelligent, he loved reading, and had a wealth of knowledge that was outstanding. He, he had filled the encyclopedia collection from A to Z, and Kimberly would res could recall spending hours and days just pouring through those to satisfy her own curiosity and love of reading. He loved crossword puzzles, and his sister sent them to him weekly from the papers in Canada. And as a consequence, his children also developed a love for word puzzles. Daddy was good at debate. He could talk for hours on any topic, from current events to politics, and he was often a regular contributor to the several calling programs on the radio. Once he became aware of how to make a WhatsApp call, it became a daily feature for him between the hours of 11 and 12, and one where he would weekly call and engage daily with his sister in friendly debates. Education was very important to my dad, and one belief which he instilled in all of us was you go to school to learn and not play the fool. And that is something I use quite often today with my children. Daddy was a family man. He was proud of all his children and grandkids and one conversation with him and you knew it. Daddy gave all of us nicknames. I was Nikki Pong, Donna was Donzy Baby or Gorilla Banana because she loved bananas when she was younger. And Kimmy was Kimmy Koo and mommy was she who must be obeyed. <laughs> he was proud of his grandkids, and every day he would ask how they were doing and what new accomplishments they had achieved. One of my lasting memories was during my pregnancy when my, with my first daughter, Destiny. I was apprehensive about telling daddy about it, but he said he was extremely proud of me, and he came with me for my final ultrasound. And before he could even see her, he looked and said, she's gonna be a red pole, and she can give a lot of trouble, but I'm gonna love her with all my heart. And so said, so done. And when he found out he was going to be a great grandfather, the first thing he told me was, no, I am truly blessed, because I get to see my first great grandchild. And when Destiny went in labor, guess who was the first? to get in the car and rush me and Destiny down to the hospital and waited with us the whole day until he finally saw his grandbaby. Daddy also engaged in many different jobs. He worked initially in his dad's business right out of school as a draftsman and then he went into sales at Hanshaw Linnis. He even traveled to Canada for work and finally started up his own security company. No matter what role he did, he was he applied his usual strictness and authority, and I'm sure his approach endeared him to many to work, so as there were many guys who he still called friends even 40 years afterwards. Uh, but below his strict nature, he was a jovial and loving person. He loved a good joke. I can remember many of the comics, especially the asterisks which we collected, he would laugh until he cried. He had a dry sense of humor, which he passed on to each and every one of his grandkids. We became a Toyota family through one of his various work roles. 
And I remember when we were looking for a, to purchase a vehicle, Daddy was adamant it had to be a Toyota. <laughs> and sometimes he puts a better sales pitch at getting a car from NASCO than any one of their workers could. And even if you say, well, Daddy, I can try to get a different car, he's like, mm-mm. <laughs> Daddy loved music, especially Toots Animators, Roger Whittaker, Gordon Lightfoot, just to name a few. I had an extensive record collection that he cherished. Don't touch them. He could not touch them. He was even musically talented, and as a youth, he formed with his brother and a few neighborhood boys a band called the Blue Notes. Daddy was meticulous about everything, his detail to record keeping, his handwriting, and even then he would boss and say, I write good for a left-hander. <laughs> His kicker was meticulous and impeccable. His attire was always on point. Daddy loved Peter Platts with sharp creases. No doubling. I remember being asked to iron a pair of pants, but it wasn't done to his satisfaction. So he stood me up and showed me how to properly press a pants. Mind you, I was a grown woman with children at the time. Kim remember having to walk along the length and breadth of Miami looking for a pair of pleated pants and without much success. I also remember the shoes had to be spotless. As children, every Sunday, daddy's regime would be to polish the shoes for school and they had to be shiny. As I grew and I had my daughter Destiny, I also instilled in her Sunday school shoes had to be cleaned. And she would sneak cross by granddad and try to fool me. But I always knew a daddy shined anywhere. Uh, speaking of his dress, whenever he dressed, his pants, his belt, and his shoes had to match. Daddy could cook and bake. I still remember the sweet bread and the salt bread. And daddy loved macaroni pie and baked pork. I still remember the pork stew. Daddy's pancakes or crepes, because they were so thin, was like no other. Every morning before, the, before school start, his grandkids had to be greeted by pancakes and bakes. If not, they would not leave. Kim remembers the cornmeal pack. And her fondest memory was when Daddy decided he was gonna give her some caramel pop a night. And mommy crawled because she was like, it's too late and too fattening for that. One of my fondest memories when I was younger was the Christmas Eve when mommy would bake the cakes and the hams. And while they were baking and after the cool, daddy and I would go for walks. We walk the length and breath of St. George waiting for the cakes to cool and we would just talk and watch the stars and just bond. Daddy was a proud man, and that pride was tested in 2019 when he had a fall that impacted his life to the point where he was deprived of his mobility. He was mostly confined to a wheelchair and dependent on others for general care and transport. And I just want to thank those who were there for that, for being there for him for that. You could tell though, even if he was affected, he didn't show it. Because if you ever asked him, he would tell you, I good, and quickly change the subject. He wasn't perfect, but as the good book says, let those without sin cast the first stone. Therefore, I commemorate my father as this, intelligent, proud, meticulous, strict, but loving, a doting grandfather and a great grandfather, friend to many, an earnest and industrious man. Goodbye, daddy. Oh,
him 387 to God be the glory great things he had done. mercies cannot be numbered. Accept our prayers on behalf of your servant, Michael Dennis, and grant him an entrance into the land of light and joy, in the fellowship of your saints, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Kindly sit for the first reading, which will be read by Mrs. Joanne Clark Dean. A reading from the Revelation to John, chapter 21, verse 1 to 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning, 
and crying, and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And they remain seated while the choir leads us. Psalm 23. seated while Kimberly Clark leads us in the second lesson. The reading is taken from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John chapter 14 verses 1 to 6. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to my and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. 
Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For him, 427. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Kindly sit, please. Some words from the book of the Revelation, the 21st chapter, the first verse. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. When the early Christians came towards the end of the second century to compile what we would now know as the New Testament, they placed this book of Revelation at the very end of their canon. And it ends, the, the latter two chapters of this book 
are really a new creation. So just as their corpus began in Genesis chapter 1 with the story of creation, they ended their corpus in Revelation 21 and 22 with a story of creation. But the story of this creation in Revelation 21 and 22 is nothing like what was there before. Because it is a creation that cannot be touched. A creation that cannot be corrupted. It is not made with human hands. It is beyond the temporal and lifts us to a place of spiritual existence. But there's just one catch. In order to experience that new creation, we first have to live in this imperfect one. This imperfect creation with all its changes and chances. This imperfect creation where we cannot predict too far ahead. And so the writer of Revelation encourages the people of his time to hold on even in the face of what appears to be downright unfair at this time. Because he is writing to a community that is experiencing persecution. First of all, they are members of a group called The Way. And The Way was this little group that started with this revolutionary teacher called Jesus. But when the Jews conspired with the Romans and had him killed, we are told that his followers were huddled in a room for fear. But yet they were infused with this gift of the Holy Spirit and they went out to preach this word. And their message was, this way is the real way to practice the Jewish faith. But over time, after the temple was destroyed, they were kicked out of the synagogues. And then when their first martyr Peter was stoned, they, were, they fled to all parts of the then known world. And there they experienced persecution, not at the hands of Jews only, but also at the hands of the Roman Empire. It was illegal to be Christian. One could be accused of being Christian and that was the end of your life. You could be placed in the Colosseum to fight wild animals just for the sport of it. At other times, Christians were rounded up and they were slashed and left at the side of the road so that dogs could have a meal. At other times, under the rule of Emperor Nero, when Nero had a banquet for his friends, he would round up some Christians, tie them to posts, and light them a fire to provide lighting for his friends. And then there was crucifixion. You could be nailed to a cross and placed on one of the major highways and left there to rot so that others will see this is not something you should practice. You should not follow this Christian thing. But here was the writer of Revelation telling those people, hold on. Hold on because what you are experiencing is not the final chapter to your existence. I see something new. I see something better in store for you. I see a new heaven and a new earth where God will be right in the midst of us all. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death will be no more, neither will there be pain or sorrow or crying anymore. For all those things belong to the first heaven and the first earth. But in order for us to experience those things, we have to face the fire. We have to face whatever comes to us in this life, trusting that we can overcome it through our faith in God. And perhaps this is what Thomas was thinking of when he heard Jesus waxing poetically on the night before he died. I am going to prepare a place for you and when I go and prepare this place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And all the others were probably nodding and Thomas is there looking at them. Y'all don't, y'all understand what he's saying? And it was Thomas was the one who came in and said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And we're told that Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What Jesus is saying to Thomas as he is saying to us, just follow the example that I have given you and you will get to where I am going. Just follow the example of how I've conducted my life in this world and you will get to the place where I'm going. Well, for us in the 21st century, the example that we're called to follow is the living word of God. 
Because in St. John's Gospel, when Jesus says, I am, he is not simply speaking of his persona, but he's speaking of his divine essence. Because by the time John comes to write his gospel towards the end of the first century, the whole notion of the physical presence of Jesus is waning in the mind of followers. They are being persecuted and some are breaking away. And so John writes his gospel different from any of the others. In a few weeks' time, we'll be talking about shepherds and wise men and Bethlehem and all those wonderful things and a star. John doesn't even mention those things. John begins his gospel in a particular way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made for him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So when Jesus says, I am in St. John's Gospel, we are really talking about the living Word of God is. The Word of God is the way, the truth, and the life. The word of God is the good shepherd. The word of God is the true bread which comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The word of God is the good shepherd that guides. And so today as we gather to give thanks to God for the life, work, and witness of our brother Michael, as you heard in the eulogy not long ago, he was one who studied. He was one who immersed himself in literature. And perhaps we're being called to do the same. Immerse ourselves in the word of God so that it becomes our guide in this life. In a few weeks' time, when we observe the penultimate Sunday of the church's year, we will say a special collect. The penultimate Sunday of the church's year, that is the Sunday before the Feast of Christ the King, it used to be called Bible Sunday. And it has a very specific collect. The prayer for that Sunday is, Almighty God, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. And that is what Jesus was saying to his followers. And ultimately, John, that was what John was saying. If we are going to overcome in this world, it is the word of God that must guide us. Because it is the word of God that tells us, sorrow endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. It is the word of God that tells us, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. Great is thy faithfulness. It is the word of God that tells us, the Lord will not cast us off forever. Though he may cause grief, he will always have compassion according to the abundance of his mercy. It is the word of God that guides us to help us to navigate the quagmire of life in this world. And so I believe even in death, just as he encouraged us to study in life, Michael would probably be encouraging us, immerse yourselves in those things that can help you to gain a greater understanding of the world around you, so that when the torrents of life confront us, so that when we encounter those obstacles that seem impassable or insurmountable, so that when we experience those things that just seem downright unfair, we do not throw our hands in the air and give up, but we press on, knowing that we are not alone on this journey. I believe this afternoon we're all being called to a moment of introspection, a moment to look within, a call for us to build up our resilience in this world so that when we face the obstacles of this life, as the writer of Revelation said, we may overcome 
and so experience the bliss of that place where all the uncertainties of life in this world will become things of the past. I encourage us to do so especially today as within the life of the church we are observing the feast of all souls. A time when we, we in the Protestant tradition, unlike our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, focus on a day to celebrate the saints who sat amongst us and who worshiped amongst us, those who influenced our lives, those who shaped who we are. As I said, unlike the Roman tradition, because in the Roman tradition, Today is a day to remember those people who died who were not so good. Yesterday we observed the Feast of All Saints when we celebrated the heroes of the church. And in the Roman church today, they'll be observing the day for people who are not so, so nice in this world and they died. And in the Roman tradition, because they were not so nice, they go to this intermediary place called Purgatory. And while they're in purgatory, their family and friends who are here on earth can go to church a couple of time to, times and say some prayers for them and do some nice deeds to build up some points in the bank of heaven. And then they can pay some money to the church to have those points redeemed so that their friend can move from purgatory upstairs into paradise. We do not believe that in the Protestant tradition. We believe that when we die, as Revelation 14 and verse 13 says, we take with us the record of our deeds. And so we observe today in thanksgiving to God for those grandmothers and grandfathers, those aunts, those moms, those dads, those uncles, persons like Michael whose lives had a positive impact on ours. Given our dubious part in this part of our dubious reputation in this part of the world, we do not expect Rome or Canterbury to tell us we're saints. We should not wait for that. We must find virtue in the people who lived amongst us, whose lives had an impact on ours. And so today, we give thanks to God for Michael, for the example he would have been to his family, to his children, for the encouragement he would have offered. And not just being facetious, having gone to that illustrious institution in St. John, I would say the only regret or the only negative thing about his life might have been attending that place in Waterford. But for fear that he may get up and say something to me, I'll just... <laughs> but nonetheless, today we give thanks to God for him. And though it's a painful moment for you, his daughters and his sister and the other members of the family, I encourage you to grieve. Cry. Your dad is gone. The one who impacted your life in a positive way has been taken from you. But I also encourage you. As you said, he was not perfect. Perfection is not for this side of the world. That's for the new heaven and the new earth. When through the grace of God, those of us who overcome here will get there. And so I encourage you to pull from his life those positive things that would have shaped you and transmit them to the generations of your family. That tenacity, that desire to learn, to constantly seek new knowledge, to understand the world around you, to appreciate what is happening around you. Pass that on. Pass that on so that generations of that fa this family will have that sense of positivism, will have that sense of pride in knowledge, in being educated, in being aware of what is taking place around you. But I also encourage you to transmit faith because one of the greatest forms of child abuse in this world, as bad as the physical abuse, as bad as the verbal abuse, as bad as the sexual abuse, as bad as the 
emotional and psychological abuse may be, the greatest form of abuse in this world is not to teach your children about God. And so I encourage you, transmit that knowledge down through the generations. For ultimately, as Jesus said to Thomas, it is the same instruction for us. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I am there means the word of God is the way, the truth, and the life. So if we wish to experience the bliss of that new heaven and that new earth, it first involves overcoming this old heaven and this old earth with all its uncertainties, with all its encumbrances. I encourage you to face the future with confidence that if we hold on to faith in God, we will get to that place. And we pray that by the grace of God, by virtue of his life's work, Almighty God may look favorably upon our brother Michael and receive him into that place where death will be no more, Neither will there be pain or sorrow or crying anymore, for the former things would have passed away. Amen. Let us now stand and reaffirm our faith in Almighty God as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. For our brother, Michael Dennis Clark, let us pray to the Lord Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Your response after each petition is, hear us, Lord. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Michael and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raised the dead to life. Raise our brother to eternal life. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Amen. Father of all, we pray to you for Michael, Dennis, and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let life perpetual shine upon them. And may he and all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Please remain standing for the commendation as we commend the soul of our brother to the care of Almighty God. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant of your saints. This hour of faith and more, may our sight but light for us. You only.
only our immortal, the creator and maker of mankind. We are mortal, formed of the earth, but to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and the dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, our Father. Let us commend our brother, Michael Dennis, to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Deliver your servant, Michael Dennis, O sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil. Set him free from every bond, that he may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations, where with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, he live and reign, one God, forever, and ever into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, the command your servant Michael Danis, acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, in the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in life. Amen. The hymn 141 and during the singing of this hymn, a collection will be taken for the upkeep of the graveyard.
I wish to extend sincere condolences to Reverend Bernard Bean and his wife, Joanne, who is the brother, the sister of Michael, and to the extended family, and pray that God may grant you strength in this your time of bereavement. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and giving life to those in the tomb. The Son of Righteousness is gloriously risen, giving light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Lord. 
Lord will guide our feet into the way of peace, having taken away the sin of the world. Christ will open the kingdom of heaven to all who believe in his name. Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you. Michael, Dennis, into paradise may the angels lead you. At your coming may the martyrs receive you and bring you to that holy city, Jerusalem. Amen. Everyone the Father gives to me will come to me. I will never turn away anyone who believes in me. My heart therefore is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, happy are the dead who die in the faith of Christ. Henceforth, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, for they take with them the record of their deeds. In the midst of life, we are in death. To whom can we turn for help but to you, Lord, who are justly angered by our sins? Lord God, Holy and mighty, 
holy and immortal, holy and most merciful Savior, deliver us from the bitter pains of eternal death. You know the secrets of our hearts. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins. And at the last hour, let us not fall away from you. In sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our brother, Michael Dennis, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we beseech you in your infinite goodness to give us grace to live in your dear love and to die in your favor, that when your well-beloved son shall come again in judgment, both this our brother Michael, Dennis, and we ourselves may be found acceptable in your sight. Grant this for the sake of your Son, Jesus, Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, with whom still live the spirits of those who die in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful are in joy and felicity, we give you heartfelt thanks for the good examples of all your servants, who, having finished their course in faith, now find rest and refreshment. May we, with all who have died in the true faith of your holy name, have perfect fulfillment and bliss in your eternal and everlasting glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Grant, O Lord, to all who are bereaved the spirit of faith and courage that they may have strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience, not sorrowing as those without hope, but in thankful remembrance of your great goodness and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord. And that light perpetual shine upon him. May he and all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face to shine upon him and be gracious to him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace.
the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Great is thy faithfulness.
Onward, Christian soldiers.
the hymn, And Can It Be?
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray, Father of all, by whose mercy and gracious saints to remain in everlasting light and peace. We remember with thanksgiving those whom we love but see no longer. And we pray that in them your perfect will may be fulfilled through Jesus Christ our Lord, unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 